This morning, friends, we're in for a special treat. Our speaker, practitioner Sandra Cooper, a facilitator of no, of no ordinary means, a practitioner, and truly one who practices this teaching in every area of her life and is sure to transform our thinking this morning. Please help me welcome practitioner Sandra Cooper to the podium. Good morning, good morning, good morning. It's always very, very good to be here and especially to be bringing the message. It's a balmy August morning but I have the blessing of the Ponciana trees in my vista. And you know, earlier some of you saw the hummingbird. Well, I don't know, the, um, the nest is gone. I don't know if they took it down or if it fell, but um, we'll, we, we have to watch and see what happens if, 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 if she will rebuild. And that will be, be a Sunday morning message in itself. I also say a very special welcome to all those of you joining us on the World Wide Web. It's awesome here in Jamaica and we wish you were here, here, but it's good to know that you can just flick a switch and you can tune in to us. Now, earlier in this month on August 1, Jamaica celebrated Emancipation Day. And that was commemorating the anniversary of full emancipation of slavery granted by the British colonial government in 1838. Now, at that time, slaves were considered full free after more than 300 years of enslavement and four years of apprenticeship because what happened was that in, in, in 1834, uh, slavery was officially abolished, but the planters held on to them for a little longer and called it apprenticeship. However, the structure of slave society after 1838 remained unchanged. From the perspective of the planters, it was the same rider on the same mule cantering towards the same destiny. They had an interest to protect, and so they implemented arbitrary taxation, anti-squatting legislation, high rentals for prime land, and low wages. Um, these are measures which enabled them to maintain their control over their human stock. The ex-slaves, on the other hand, had an interest to advance, to eke out a livelihood that was independent of their former existence. And uh, sadly, they never had the power to fight successfully against these new oppressive restrictions. The chains of slavery had gone, but the hands of the free men and women continued to be tied by the law, by racism, and the lack of resources that they needed to survive. This new oppression would naturally have an impact on the psyche of the former slaves. Now, those that were more aggressive and self-determined would have found ways to circumvent those limitations and thrive. However, for the majority, the physical aspect of chains and shackles gave way to psychological chain, chains and shackle, shackles, to the paradigms and limiting beliefs of I can't, it's too hard, I'm not good enough, I can't do any better. This thinking dug deeply into the consciousness of the former slave and it became the mental slavery referred to by our orator, philosopher, and national hero, Marcus Garvey. And that sense of mental slavery was no less real than the constraints of metal chains and shackles. Now let's fast forward, it's 2018, 180 years later. And sadly, some of these old paradigms continue to keep us enslaved. Are we familiar with some of them? I can't. Oh, I don't have the money. Boy, there's just not enough time. Where am I going to find it? 
Suppose I fail. What will people think? And we could go on and on with a list of some of these limiting thoughts. So we, we might celebrate emancipation as a people, but the question is, how free are we really? Visiting a circus one day, a man noticed that the elephants were being held by only a small rope tied to their front leg. There were no chains <clears throat> and no cages. It was obvious that these huge creatures could pull away these ropes and break free in an instant, but for some reason they did not. He asked the trainer standing nearby why these animals just stood there and made no attempt to get away. Well, the trainer said, when they are very young and much smaller, we use the same size rope to tie them, and at that age, it's enough to hold them. As they grow up, they, they come to believe that the rope can still hold them. So they never try to break free. The man was amazed. These animals could at any time pop the rope and break free. But they didn't, or they couldn't, because they believed that they couldn't. And so they stayed right where they were. Like the elephants, how many of us go through life tied to a belief that we cannot do something simply because someone said so, or because we may have tried it once and failed? Or should I say, instead of fa that it failed, it didn't work? I'm reminded of, is it, is it Edison? How many attempts he made at the light bulb? Who remembers how many attempts before he got the light bulb right? About 10,000? Now, can you imagine if he gave up at 9,999? Well, we'd have had somebody else that we attribute the invention of the light bulb to. So if we take a close look at our lives, we probably find some of the same deep-seated beliefs that continue to stop us from feeling free to act in certain aspects of our relationships, our jobs, our careers, and even our health and fitness. You know, there's a whole psychology around losing weight. Oh, January 1, I'm going to lose some weight this year. Who is familiar with that? I hear a murmur. Okay, and then what happens by the end of January? Okay, we'll, we'll have another Sunday morning talk about that. A pertinent question that we can ask is, where in my life do I feel stopped, stuck, are unable to be who I want to be, do what I want to do, or have what I want to have. Freedom to be, to do, and to have is our birthright. And this morning, I'm going to spend a, a little time and look at what it really means to be full free. Because the slaves, the ex-slaves, after four years of apprenticeship, they, they, they created the term full free, meaning that they were free to be, but that was a different story. To be free means that we firstly acknowledge that we are made in the image and likeness of God, that we are living uniquely and perfectly as an expression of universal consciousness as no one else can. We are here to be the light of love, creativity, and joy, each of us powerful beyond measure, and surrounded by the infinite intelligence that is waiting for our recognition of it. Our understanding of this truth is the path to being full free. This is the truth that the master teacher Jesus was talking about when he said, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. When you get this truth, when you learn this truth, when you know this truth, we will be able to experience freedom from the bondage of, of, of false thinking, and then we can accept personal responsibility for every thought that we think, every conscious awareness in the present moment and we are capable then of creating a glorious new future of
possibility and full creative expression. Yeah, man, we will be really bad mama jammers. <laughs> Knowing who we truly are leaves us free to love ourselves just the way we are, to not take everything quite so seriously and to enjoy our spiritual journey. I have a friend who said in the early part of his, his journey in truth, he used to get very upset when he made a mistake or he screwed up or he got sick or lost a client or was broke. And then as, as he got deeper into the teaching, being broke didn't mean anything. He just reframed it and made it mean at this point I have no money and just stopped resisting the fight and the struggle with money and stop resisting the struggle with weight and stop resisting the struggle with trying to get clients. So in, 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 in an experience of self-love, we learn how to look at ourselves through non-judgmental eyes and we get to love and appreciate the self, ourselves just the way we are. For that spectacular, awesome human being that we are, warts, wrinkles, love handles, and all. Let's say together, I am an amazing and spectacular human being. I am an amazing and spectacular I, human being. I am not convinced. Let me hear it now and, make, and you say it like you believe it. I am an amazing and spectacular human being. One more time. I am an amazing and spectacular human being. Turn to the person next to you and say, you are an amazing and spectacular human being. Living freely means that we want to squeeze the juice out of every moment we are alive and put love and laughter at the top of our daily to-do lists. You know, every year our wonderful playwright that I'm seeing in the audience this morning puts a play out. And what Basil is doing is squeezing the juice out of his creativity. Am I correct, Basil? You wake up one morning and you have an idea for a play and it just comes. Maestro will wake up one morning and just some notes will just sing and dance in his head and then he will just play. And so we have a lot of creative juice inside of us and we need to just allow it to come out. We need to squeeze it out and allow it to express. If we get out of the way, <laughs> and that's the ego voice that says I can't and it's, I don't have enough time and boy, I'm too old now and I can't start a business now. If we get that out of the way, and let, let life express through us, magnificent things will begin to happen. Humankind has this wonderful gift of choice. I've always said that maybe the first choice in terms of the um, Adam and Eve story was the story of Eve and the apple. I don't think Eve was fully present to the fact that it was an active choice on her part to pick and eat the apple, you think? Nor Adam, for that matter, who accepted the apple when it was offered to him. When suddenly that they, um, when they realized that they were naked. I mean, they were walking around in the buff for the longest while. And it didn't seem to matter. And then all of a sudden, oops, and the fig leaves had to come out. But after they hid themselves and God called to them, in Genesis 3, 11 to 13, um, God asked, so who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? And Adam's reply was, um, um, the, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some of the fruit of, of, of the tree and I ate. In turn, Eve's reply was, um, uh, the, the, the serpent deceived me and I ate. My friends, we've been making choices and blaming others for their consequences ever since. So since we have freedom of choice, it behooves us to make wise choices. Freedom is our right, but with freedom comes responsibility and accountability. Freedom is not a license to do as we please, and so it, it, it must be exercise responsibility. 
or, or responsibly. So we get a license to drive a car. That doesn't mean that we're going to speed on the road and hit down people. That license will be taken away. If we, if we commit a crime, our freedom will be taken away. Reverend David Ault states, if I find myself walking the road of diminished worth and broken dreams, I have the capability and the choice to get off of it instantly and walk a different mental road. Even if I'm walking a road of steady familiarity, I have the capability to instantly exit and transfer to a greater path of passion and expansion. I really hope that you get that. Because sometimes life is okay, you know, and we're going along and we are satisfied. And there's nothing wrong and we're okay. But in, in being okay, we can become complacent and settle. Not because there's not a, a, a stone in our shoe. That doesn't mean that we have to wear, wear the same shoe all the time. Okay? So, in conscious awareness, we have the power to choose our thoughts and what we make them mean. That's a big, big thing. Because the thoughts will come. But what is it that we are making those thoughts mean? We are always free to make decisions that empower us, but we can equally, equally make decisions that diminish us. And the good thing about choice is we, we, we can do what we say in our vernacular. We can wheel and come again. We can choose again. When we intend wholeness and we align with spirit, we liberate ourselves from painful missteps, I don't like to call them failures, missteps, and lay the foundation for a rich and more satisfying life. Here's another affirmation I'd like you to say with me. And I'll say it first. I am free to choose the highest and best for myself and my life. Together. I am free to choose the highest and best for myself and my life. Isn't that a wonderful space to know that I'm free to choose? You know that life has many twists and turns, and its way of presenting temp tempting distractions or painful obstacles, which seduce us into blaming, complaining, and remaining stuck in limitation. So I want you to think about what is your trigger? What is it that gets you upset? What is it that gets you off the track? What is it that moves you away from your spiritual practice? Think about it. And just hold that thought for a little bit. What is it that makes you give your power away? So just a gentle reminder. When we co complain and call on our friends and say, boy, you know, and we talk about what's not working. The more we talk about it, we are, the more energy we are giving to that thing that is not working. So it's to become aware that, oops, I've said it again, and to stop it, okay? So what you think about comes about. Grumbling and complaining is calling in the very thing that you don't want. Consider being the, that person to glorify God in the midst of confusion. Consider being that person to glorify God in the midst of confusion. Be that person to travel the valley of the shadow with poise and grace. I heard someone say, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall not stay and build a condominium. <laughs> that peace that we have when we call on God first is realized within, and it will forever reestablish the harmony in the outer world of circumstances. And I've tested this. Um, my son calls and I, want, I recognize the ring on the phone and my stomach reacts immediately and the instant reaction is, what happened now? It is so visceral. I know that it's Kevin calling and I, my first thought is, what happened now? And then I become aware of it and I breathe. And I say, okay. All is well. And the stomach settles. And it's usually, hi, mom. 
boy went so and so yesterday and so and so and so happened. And so it's that, that, that default of worry. Who, who can recognize that default of worry? Just raise your hands. The default, you go to the default of worry first. So as a practitioner, I am aware of it. And I don't fight it anymore. I feel what I feel. So I deal with it and I move on. It's fighting with it and say, oh, I shouldn't feel this way. Why am I'm, I supposed to know that all is well and all is... No, that is making it worse. I just, it's like being in the sea and just riding the waves. The wave come, comes and you just ride it and, until the next one. And enjoy it in the process. So at having this life of wholeness and freedom requires that we learn how to shift our thinking or reframe the moment rather than denying, excluding, or avoiding the stuff that is going on. The peace that is realized within when we affirm God, excuse me, will forever reestablish harmony in our outer world. So let's, let's say this affirmation together. I travel life's roads with peace, poise, and grace. I travel life's roads with peace, poise, and grace. We can then find new meaning in what the human or the critical eye sees as fact and affirm what the sacred heart already knows, that God truly is all that there is. Another key element of freedom is, if we are firmly committed to our purpose to awaken humanity to its spiritual magnificence, then we need to make sure that we see others as perfect, whole, complete, and free. If we allow people the freedom to be who they are in the moment, then we can make room for the greatness in everyone. And we can detach from judgment and discrimination around people's behavior, no matter what that behavior looks like. Isn't that freeing? That people are being who they are being, and we don't make it mean anything. So let's say together, I see myself as perfect, whole, complete, and free. Perfect, whole, complete, and free. And turn to the next person and say, I see you as perfect, whole, complete, and free. I see you as perfect, whole, complete, and free. Oh. So just imagine saying that to somebody that you don't like. Or somebody that irritates you. Or somebody that, you know... Um, comes up to your, your windscreen, after your, your car, after you just leave the, uh, after Sean has just washed it, and they come and they clean the windscreen. And if you were to sort of take a deep breath and see them as perfect, whole, complete, and free, what difference would it make? I'm sure it would make a big difference. Being fully emancipated means being free from the control or influence of the past. When a relationship ends for whatever reason, wouldn't it be great if we could release associated thoughts of hurt and anger, give thanks for the lessons learned, and invite in loving thoughts of forgiveness, understanding, and compassion in their place? Wouldn't that, wouldn't that be awesome? Imagine the shift in energy that that would create and what it would enable us to bring to the next relationship. Such higher level consciousness would surely raise our vibration releasing us from the bondage of rejection, mistrust, insecurity, and all of that stuff is usually very carefully packed up in yesterday's baggage. This kind of release will definitely free us to create wonderful new possibilities for ourselves as we become powerful magnets of attraction for multiple blessings. Let's say it together. I am free from the control and influence of the past. I am free from the control and influence of the past. And by the way, it doesn't necessarily have to be the bad things in the past, you know. But, but some of the things that we have been doing for a long time, and this is how I've always done it, that's still control and influence. And I take the advice that my ex-husband gave many, many years ago. He says, what used to was can't are. So that helps with the release. 
And the science of mind offers principles and strategies for living a life of full freedom. As our Declaration of Principles states, we believe that the ultimate goal of life to be a complete emancipation from every discord of every nature, and that this goal is sure to be attained by all. The principles and ideas that we teach work only if we put into practice what we make, what, 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 what we are learning. Little snippets that you take away from a Sunday morning service. What some of the discussions and the aha moments from our Tuesday evening healing service, a discussion with a practitioner, what we read in a book, what we come and experience in a class, okay? And so we need to know that this is a practical teaching, but it only works if we work it. If you need to make changes to lead a healthier life, then make them. As, as Centers for Spiritual Living leader Dr. Ken Gordon puts it, this is a philosophy that must inevitably lead to a deeper understanding of the perfection and brilliance of life. Isn't that wonderful? At this point, um, I'm not gonna have a checklist of things to do to get full freedom. Right? I'm just gonna give you one this morning. And that is prayer. Every time you go into prayer, know that you are not doing it alone. You're partnering with God to create the highest and best that you possibly can. When you feel confused and in uh, mental or emotional turmoil about a situation, the most effective first prayer is one of clarity. One of clarity. We can be so caught up in the drama of the situation because when it's happening to us personally, we don't really see we're very myopic, okay? So if we can pray for clarity, we can be able to step back and see the big picture. When we pray for clarity, we are expanding our ability to, to sort through the mental and emotional fog, to see the spiritual truth, and to determine what we really want and what best serves everyone involved. I have a situation at home where um, somehow bees have invaded. They, they, they found a crack in the wall outside of my home and they have made a hive. And what I get to understand is this is just outside of my bathroom. And where the bathtub is, is a huge cavity. You, you can't see it from the outside, but they have used that space to make their hive. And this has been going on for about two years. What I do in the evenings is lock up the windows because they come into the light. Last December, I got stung for about the third time over the past two years. And that sting put me in the hospital. And if I didn't get to hospital, I would have passed. And so every now and again, I say, oh, I have to do something about bees, have to do something about the bees. I finally uh, um, got a bee person to come and he looked at it and he said it's gonna cost $20,000. So I passed the information on to my landlord. The first reaction was, 20,000 for bees? Why we don't just tape up the hole, you know, cement up the hole? And so, and so the, the bee person returned the, the response by saying, firstly, uh, any mason that comes, the, comes there to try and do that with, without understanding the bees, will be attacked, that's the first thing. Secondly, they will either bore through the wet cement or they'll bore into the house. So we are now trying to find a, a triple win, a, 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 a solution that suits me as a householder, that suits the landlord in terms of their cost, and that suits the bees, because we want them to live, don't we? I can imagine if, if, if there were a hundred of hundred like me and we took away the bees, we wouldn't have any flowers. We wouldn't have um, the sort of lovely flora that we have this, this morning. So the idea is to use um, prayer to find a triple win. Because I don't want to kill the bees and I, want, I don't want to get stung again. Okay? So 
when the fog lifts after prayer and we can see clearly, the next level is to pray for guidance, which is what I'm doing. Asking for guidance, what exactly do I do about these bees? And then when we, 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 we are able to get that guidance, we can now have the courage to let go, let God and trust when spirit leads to know that there is a complete and perfect result. If there is uncertainty as to how to pray, you're in the right place. And you can always call into a, a, a minister or a practitioner and any one of us will be happy to pray with you. In closing, it was Garvey who said, God and nature first made us what we are. And then out of our own created genius, we make ourselves what we want to be. Follow always that great law. Let the sky and God be our limit and eternity our measurement. End of that quote. Isn't that wonderful? The New Thought Movement is a theology of personal liberation. This teaching is here to help every one of us break free from thoughts of lack, limitation, doubt, and fear, and make ourselves what we want to be, how to embrace wholeness, peace, joy, and have them as a natural way of life. The longing that you and I have of being emancipated from every discord of every nature is a universal longing. Not just me and you, but everyone in every part of the globe. And in order to fulfill that longing, we've got to do the work ourselves. Garvey charges us in his most famous words. And I want you to say them with me, and I'm not going to say them first. Emancipate yourselves from mental slavery. None but ourselves can free our mind. Let's, let us sing it again. Emancipate ourselves from mental slavery. None but ourselves can free our mind. Have no fear for atomic energy. Cause none of them can stop at the time. How long can we be our brothers while we stand aside and look? Ooh. Some say it's just a part of it. We've got to fulfill the book. Won't you hate to sing these songs of freedom? Enjoy being full free. Namaste.